Blessed Lord Jesus Christ, at this hour, you hung upon the cross, stretching out your loving arms to embrace the world by your death. Grant that all people of the earth, especially this congregation, may look to you today and see our salvation. For your mercy's sake we pray, amen. The order of service is found entirely in the bulletin today. I would invite the congregation to rise and turn to face the processional cross. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O oh, come, let us worship him. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O oh, come, let us worship him. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O oh, come, let us worship him. On Good Friday, there are reproaches spoken from various prophets. These are spoken to ancient Israel, to the world today, to us. It represents God's word of law, of condemnation of sin. Thus, says the Lord, what have I done to you, O oh my people? And wherein have I offended you? Answer me, for I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death, and you have delivered your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross, O oh my people. Lamb of God, pure and holy, who on the cross did suffer, ever patient and lowly, thyself to scorn did suffer. All sins thou borest for us, else had despair reigned o'er us. Have mercy on us, O Jesus. Thus says the Lord, what have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me, for I have conquered all your foes, and you have given me over, and delivered me to those who persecute me, for I have fed you with my word, and refreshed you with living water, and you have given me gall and vinegar to drink, O my people. Lamb of God, pure and holy, who on the cross 
must it suffer ever patient and lowly thyself to scorn did suffer all sins the for us, else had despair reigned o'er us. Mercy on us, O Jesus, O Jesus. Thus says the Lord, what have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me, what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? My people, is this how you thank your God, O my people? Lamb of God, pure and holy, who on the cross did suffer, ever patient and lowly, thyself to scorn did suffer. All sins thou borest for us, else had despair reigned o'er us. Thy peace be with us, O Jesus, O Jesus, the Lord be with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you carried our sins in your body on the tree so that we might have life. May we and all who remember this day find new life in you now and in the world to come where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The first scripture lesson for this Most Holy Friday is from the book of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, written 700 years B.C., before Christ, in which the prophet Isaiah speaks prophetically of the coming of God's servant son, the Messiah, the Christ, and what he would do for our salvation. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. 
and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for a sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord.
Our second reading is from the epistle to the Hebrews, chapters 4 and 5. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. We sing the hymn of the day, number 426. Brothers and sisters, throughout this Lent, these 40 days, we have been reading through the Gospel of John. We have been walking through the signs of Jesus and what he did in our world. And we've heard from his many witnesses. Along the way, we've been walking, we've been coming nearer and nearer to Calvary. Today, we hear the witness of the gospel writer himself, from the foot of the cross, the beloved disciple. A reading from John 19. It was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, on that Saturday, for that Saturday was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that the legs of those who were crucified might be broken and that they might be 
taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows he is telling the truth that you may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. Watching the crucifixion is uncomfortable. It is gruesome and bloody. The theme of blood runs from the scriptures from beginning to end. When did the blood first appear in the Bible? I mean, not blood coursing through the veins of all the living, but blood that marked death. It was after sin. An animal was sacrificed by God. And that animal was used, its skins were used to cover the man and the woman in their shame. We know the Gospel of John is going to be about blood. When twice in chapter 1, John the baptizer says of Jesus, his cousin, Behold the Lamb of God, who like the Lamb of the Atonement, takes away the sin of the world. Jesus says that blood is what he's all about, and it's what his people are all about. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood, Jesus says in John 6, has eternal life. In John's gospel, the function of blood is to deal with, to address, to cover sin. Sin's the problem from cover to cover of the Bible. As God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. Just because sin is knocking as God sets it before Cain doesn't mean we have to let it in. But we have, and we do. And the acts of sin, the mental actions, the words, the verbal actions, the physical actions, when we see it in view of the law, and ask, what have I done? We find ourselves feeling naked and ashamed. There are some rather ugly consequences. So what do we do with sin? Humanity's tried many different courses of action. One common one is projection. Take the sin that we feel on our heart and project it onto someone else. Blame others. Blame the system, blame your parents, blame your teachers, blame your spouse, blame the government, blame the media. But still, there's always a nagging feeling that the problem's much closer to the heart. There's always the rational route. We can try to rationalize our sin. It was no big deal. Nobody knew. It wasn't that bad. I'm not as bad as my sister or my boss. Well, compared to that guy, I know he's a sinner. I look kind of like a saint. But in view of God's holiness, none of us comes away pure and holy. Another way that we try to deal with sin is, and this is common, repression. We try to push it down. Not think about it. We push it way, way down. Live in denial. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to think about it. But it keeps coming up, nagging us like an obsessive thought. Then there's distraction. We busy ourselves. We have a calendar that's full from Sunday through Saturday. We rush here and there until we collapse, run ragged, hitting our pillow, hoping that we won't remember what's haunting us. Another strategy is evasion. We distract ourselves. 
pop a pill, have a drink, smoke a joint, watch TV, sports, money, video games, anything to avoid the reality of being alone with our sin. But we're here today because we know that all of these have a fundamental flaw. None of them work. None of these strategies are able to remove the sin that clings so closely to our flesh, to our mind. We go to bed and wake up in the middle of the night and sin is there. We wake up the next day and our sin is still there. It ravages our psyche and our body and this nation and our world. The reality of sin is what makes things miserable. Because of this reality, God has opened up, God has revealed, God has given a prescription, a solution. And the solution is here. We are invited today to stand with the beloved disciple, John, the brother of James, the son of Zebedee, at the foot of the cross. Just as he writes, he who has saw these things has borne witness. I am telling the truth that you may believe. John was there. John was right there at the feet of Jesus during the crucifixion. He saw it all happen. He saw the blood. He saw the tears. He saw the Savior's death. He saw the Savior dealing with sin, washing away sin, covering sin, covering the sin of the world as he promised. John's sin, my sin, his sin, her sin, their sin, your sin. The world's sin is dealt with at the cross. In Christ, all sin is forgiven. And that's why, despite or because of the horrors of it all. Today we call it Good Friday. It was very difficult to look at. I recognize this is a gruesome picture, uh, but if you watch something like uh, The Passion of the Christ, uh, you'll see that what Jesus endured in the flesh was horrendous. And the first process of a crucifixion was not the physical violence, but it was the emotional trauma. Jesus was stripped, stripped naked, exposed, shamefully exposed multiple times before Herod, by Herod's soldiers, then again at the command of Pilate, and then again at the cross when the soldiers divided his garments. After Jesus was stripped, he was flogged, he was lacerated with leather whips, with bits of metal or ceramic pottery at the tips. It tore into his skin, down into his muscles, and he was quivering. Jesus, long before he made it to Calvary, was losing blood. Once he was on the road to Calvary, he was very weak. He was traumatized, and that's why he could not go on. That's why Simon of Cyrene had to carry his cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, the rocky place, the place where there was no life. And they used uh, spikes to, to pin him up against the wood of the cross. And his arms were stretched out just far enough so that they would be dislocated. It was terribly painful. His body hung, and he struggled each breath uh, be able to lift his body uh, to get air. So he would have pushed up then with his feet against the nail in his feet, and he would feel pain there. His feet would eventually lock up. And for hours and hours of tears and prayers, this struggled breathing went on with Christ's shredded back pushing up and down against the coarse wood of the tree. Eventually, at uh, surprising speed for those who were carrying out the crucifixion, 
Christ was so exhausted that he could no longer lift himself. He could no longer get air. He could not breathe. He was struggling with asphyxia. And when that happens, the heart stops working. Jesus died of asphyxia and a cardiac arrest. And the scriptures say it was for us. When we are in pain, physical pain, emotional pain, Jesus cries out for us, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When our heart's not working correctly, when our body is failing, Jesus cries out with us, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus went to the cross for you. One man who understood this very well was uh, the Dutch painter, Peter Paul Rubens. Peter Paul Rubens was commissioned to do an altarpiece uh, for a church. And he was given as the subject for his altarpiece what he called the descent from the cross. Uh, It's Jesus surrounded by his friends after his last breath being taken to his tomb. Peter Paul Rubens, while he was commissioned and paid to do this first painting, He was so fascinated by that descent from the cross, so caught up by it, that he went and painted three more copies from slightly different angles. He saw something very profound taking place at Golgotha. What do you see? Do you see the dark sky, the billowing clouds hanging over the world in its darkness? Do you see the sun finally going down in the west, being reflected off the shroud that they're using to wrap their Lord, their master. Do you notice how astute those uh, Renaissance painters were, how uh, well they observed the human body? He gets the proportions right, right down to the skin color of Jesus, which is already going greenish-yellow. On the left-hand side, dressed in dark blue, you see Mary, the mother of Jesus. Her skin has that same color of Jesus' body. This is a reflection on the prophecy of Simeon, spoken when Jesus, as a baby, was presented in the temple. When Simeon said to Mary, a sword will pierce through your heart as well. And every parent who's had a sick child Every parent who's lost a child to death in this world has tasted the same pain. Another individual we recognize is the woman at Jesus' feet holding his foot, probably the same woman who anointed Jesus' feet, preparing him for his burial. Mary, Mary of Bethany, Mary the sister of Lazarus, We notice on the left-hand side a man with a nice cap and expensive clothing. That's Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy man who the scripture says took courage and asked Pilate for Jesus' body, who provided burial perfume for Jesus' body and, out of his own expense, a tomb, a place to bury him. And then on the right, also helping, is Nicodemus, Uh, dressed in black. He first came to Jesus in the night, afraid of what people would think. But when he saw this great love, he came into the light, knowing the light of God. And the person who stands out just below Nicodemus, who's that? Well, that's the beloved disciple. That's John who saw and noted all these things. His eyes are fixed on Mary, just like Jesus had told him to do. My disciple, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. John is doing as he's instructed. He's caring for Mary in her sorrow. But why is he dressed in red? That is the question Peter Paul Rubens wants us to ask. Why is John dressed in red? 
That redness is spiritual. It is deep. It is profound. Where does it come from? It comes from the blood of the Lamb, the blood that came from Jesus' thorn-pierced forehead, the blood that came from his lacerations on his back, the blood that came down from his hands and his feet and from his side. John is dressed in red because he, his heart, his soul, he is covered in blood, in the blood of the only begotten Son of God, in the innocent blood of God's dear Son. This is John's testimony. His testimony is true, and his testimony is for you. Today, St. John, the beloved disciple, witnesses to Christ and invites us to put on robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You'll notice on the very bottom right-hand corner of the painting, there's a, a paper that's blown down off the cross. Uh, that paper is the, the paper written up by uh, Pilate, written in three languages. In, if you look close, it's in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin. Uh, it's where we get the famous letters I-N-R-I, uh, Jesus Nazarenus, Nazarenus Rex Iudaiorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And that plate is laying up against next to an offering plate. And in that offering plate is the offering that Jesus has given for the life of the world. His crown, his crown of thorns, his crown of victory, and his blood so that his church throughout the world would be able to receive his blood, receive his gifts, receive his life, and stand before his cross, cleansed, forgiven, free, covered. Today, the church of God, with Peter Paul Rubens painting the way, stands at the foot of the cross, washed in the blood of Jesus, this is God's solution for sin. This is the best, the only, the truest answer for the problem of sin. Therefore, having been dressed in the covering given to us by God, let us linger now at the foot of the cross, forgiven, free, forever. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for prayer. Let us pray for the whole Christian church that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary and keep her perpetually in the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ and in his word of truth, keep, we ask you, in safety your church spread throughout all nations so that we may be defended against the adversary and may serve you in true faith and persevere in confession of your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. O oh, merciful Father in heaven, because you hold in your hand all the might of man, and because you have ordained for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do well, you have created all powers that exist in all the nations of the world. We humbly pray that you would graciously regard your servants, especially Joseph, our president, the Congress of the United States, our Supreme Court, Tony, our governor, 
and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws, that all who have received what the scriptures call the sword as your ministers, that they may bear it faithfully according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that he would deliver the world from all error, take away disease, ward off famine, set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick and a safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God, you are the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak. May the prayers of those who are in any tribulation or distress come before you today and grant that in all their necessities they may receive and rejoice in your desire, your will, and your power to help and to comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our enemies, that God would remember them in mercy and graciously grant them such things as both needful for them and profitable for their salvation. O almighty and everlasting God, through your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have commanded us to love our enemies and to do good to those who hate us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and your whole Christian church. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessing upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his own good will. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you create and you continue to bless and uphold all things in this world. We pray that you would reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through dwelling in our hearts, we may by your grace be made ready to receive all your blessings on the fruits of the earth and whatever pertains to our bodily needs. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray all these things. Amen. Please be seated for the offering.
We continue with the hymn stanza at the top of page four in the bulletin, Jesus, I Will Ponder Now. Jesus, I will ponder now on your holy passion. With your spirit me endow for such meditation. Grant that I in love and faith may the image cherish of your suffering pain and death that i may not perish hear now the account of the passion of the christ focusing on our Lord's last significant words from the cross, reported by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified Jesus, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. 
They said, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. What thou, my Lord, hast suffered was all for sinners gain. Mine, mine was the transgression, but thine the deadly pain. Savior, deserve thy place. Look on me with thy face. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his house. Be of one holy family, loving since your love we see. Hear us, holy Jesus. 
From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Jesus had said previously, anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Later on the cross, knowing that all was now completed and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. Jesus, in your thirst and pain, what wounds your lifeblood drain? Hear us, holy Jesus. Still, for your holy work fulfill, satisfy your loving will, hear us, holy Jesus. May we thirst your love to know, sin our sin and woe, where the healing waters flow. Hear us, holy Jesus. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. 
that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. On the cross, when he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. Perfect life of love. All, all is finished now. All that he left his throne above to below. is left undone of all the Father willed. His toil, his sorrows, one by one, the scriptures have fulfilled. But he has felt it smart, all forms of human grief and care have pierced that tender heart. And on his thorn-crowned head, and on his sinless soul, our sins in all their guilt was laid, that he might make us whole. In perfect life he dies, for me he dies for me. Oh, all atoning sacrifice, I cling by faith to Thee. Darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father! Into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Tremble, tremble, tremble. 
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Punishment so strange is suffered yonder. The shepherd dies for sheep that love to wander. The master pays the debt his servants owe him who would not know him. The sinless Son of God must die in sadness. The sinful child of man may live in gladness. Man forfeited his life and is acquitted. God is committed. Jesus said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life in this world will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh, Father, look with love upon your people this day, the same love which the Lord Jesus Christ showed us when he delivered himself to evil men and suffered the agony of the cross. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Abide with me, fast. 
fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide, with other helpers fail and comfort sleep, help of the helpless oh, abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Hands morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me. We traditionally uh, have three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, which make one worship service. So we wait till Easter to receive the final blessing of the Lord. Our Easter services will be held at 7 a.m. with the sunrise service or 10 a.m. with Easter breakfast between. We look forward to that joyful day. Go in peace.